Hey, what's up YouTube? In this video, I'm going to introduce the notion of a reduced echelon matrix, and then we'll go over a row reduction algorithm that provides a method for transforming any matrix into a row equivalent matrix in reduced echelon form. Now, before I give the properties that a matrix needs to have to be in reduced echelon form, let me first give two preliminary definitions. So first, by a non-zero row, we just mean a row that contains at least one non-zero entry. And then for our second definition, we define the leading entry of a row to be the leftmost non-zero entry in that row. Now with these two definitions, we're ready to define what it means for a matrix to be in reduced echelon form. So we say that a rectangular matrix is in reduced echelon form if it has the following four properties. First, it must have the property that all non-zero rows are above any rows of all zeros. Second, each leading entry of a row must be in a column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it. Third, the leading entry in each non-zero row must be equal to one. And fourth, it must have that each leading one is the only non-zero entry in its column. Now, if some rectangular matrix has only the first two properties, we say that that matrix is in echelon form. So echelon form has less requirements than reduced echelon form. Now, when we say an echelon matrix, we just mean any matrix that's in echelon form. Similarly, when we say a reduced echelon matrix, that's just any matrix that's in reduced echelon echelon form. So let's look at some examples now. Let's consider these four matrices and we're going to decide if they are in either echelon form, reduced echelon form, or neither. So let's start with this matrix. We can see that this matrix has one row of all zeros, but that row is below all non-zero rows, so it satisfies the first property. Now the leading entry of the first row is this one, the leading entry for the second row is this one, and then the leading entry for the third row is this one. And so you can see that this matrix satisfies the second property, since each leading entry of a row is in a column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it. So it kind of makes this staircase-like pattern. And now since it satisfies the first two properties, we know that it's at least in echelon form. So we'll check the last two properties to see if it's reduced echelon form. So it satisfies the third property because all of these leading entries are ones, but it doesn't satisfy the fourth property because you can see that this leading one here has another non-zero entry in its column, this one. And then similarly, this leading one in the third row has these two ones, which are non-zero in its column. So this matrix is only an echelon form. Now for our next matrix, we see that there's no rows of all zeros. So trivially, the first property is satisfied. Now we have this one, this one, and this one being the leading entries of the three rows. And again, we get this sort of staircase-like pattern which tells us that each leading entry of a row is in a column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it, so property two is satisfied. We also have that property three is satisfied since each of these leading entries are one. And then since each of these three leading ones are the only non-zero entries in its column, we can see that this matrix satisfies property four, and so this matrix is in reduced echelon form. Now for this next matrix, for property two, notice the leading entry for the third row is this one, and then the leading entry for the fourth row is this one here. But you can see that this leading entry is not in a column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it, so it doesn't satisfy the second property. So this matrix is neither echelon nor reduced echelon form. Now finally, for our last example, we have this matrix and we have a row of all zeros, but it's the bottom row, so it satisfies the first property. Now the leading entries are this one, this two, and then this one, where each leading entry of a row is in the column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it, so the second property is satisfied. So this matrix is in echelon form, but let's check the other two properties as well. So first notice that the third Third property is not satisfied because this two is a leading entry but it's not equal to one and then also the fourth property is not satisfied because notice that this leading entry for the third row this one here is not the only non-zero entry in its column we also have this other one above so this matrix is not in reduced echelon form but it is in echelon form now at this point you might be wondering why we even care about echelon or reduced echelon form and the reason we care is because echelon and reduced echelon matrices are very useful for solving linear systems we'll see in later videos that when the augmented matrix of a linear system is in echelon form, then we'll be able to instantly tell if the system is consistent and also how many solutions the system has. And then if a matrix is in reduced echelon form, then we've essentially solved the system. Now unfortunately, the augmented matrices of most linear systems are not automatically in reduced echelon form. But it turns out that we can use our three elementary row operations to transform any matrix into a row equivalent matrix that's in reduced echelon form. And so now I'm going to talk about a method for doing this that works on any matrix. 
So we'll be using something called the row reduction algorithm, also sometimes referred to as Gaussian elimination. So this algorithm will take in any arbitrary matrix and output a row equivalent matrix that's in reduced echelon form. So we're just going to suppose that we start out with an arbitrary matrix. Then step one of the algorithm says that we need to begin with the leftmost non-zero column in the matrix. So for example, if we have this matrix here, then the leftmost non-zero column is the second column. And then we call this column a pivot column. So the second column is a pivot column. Now the position at the top of this column is called a pivot position. So in our example, the first row of the second column, so this position here, is our pivot position. And I want to point out that the pivot position does not change, even if the value in the pivot position changes. And that's because the pivot position is a location in the matrix, so it doesn't depend on the value. Now for the second step, we need to select any non-zero entry in the pivot column. So in our example, we have this one and this three, and the algorithm says we can choose either one of these entries, so let's just go ahead and choose the one. Then once we've selected the non-zero entry in the pivot column, step two says that if necessary, we need to interchange two rows to move this entry into the pivot position. So we're going to want to interchange the first and third rows to get this one into our pivot position. Now when we interchange these two rows, we get this new matrix. And now we call this entry that we've selected and put in our pivot position, we call this a pivot. And we call this entry a pivot because you can think about us using this pivot entry to pivot the other equations around the solution set. So to visually see what I mean by that, consider this augmented matrix that represents this linear system of equations. Now we can graph these two equations. So this purple line represents the first equation and then this green line is the second equation. And you can see that they intersect at this single point when x and y are both equal to one. Now for this matrix, this position is our pivot position. And we have two possible choices for our pivot. It can either be this one from the first equation or this one from the second equation. So if we use this one that's already in the pivot position and we say that that is our pivot, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this one to eliminate the one below it. So we'll do that by replacing the second row with the sum of itself and negative one times the first row, which will give us this row equivalent matrix. And then this matrix represents the linear system with the first equation being x minus y is equal to zero. And then the second equation is given by two y is equal to two or equivalently y is equal to one. So if we draw those two equations, this purple line for our first equation will stay the same. But now our second equation is this y equal to one line, where you can see that we took the second equation of our original system, this green line, and then we just sort of pivoted it without changing the solution set to get this new line where the equation of this new line doesn't depend on x. So that's one way of thinking about this pivot entry. And if we would have instead swapped these two rows and used this as our pivot entry, then we would have been pivoting this purple line instead of the green line. So this was just to give you some intuition on why we call it a pivot. But now let's continue on with the third step of our algorithm. So the third step says that we're going to use row replacement operations to create zeros in all positions below the pivot position. So in our example, we'll want to get zeros in these two positions below the one. To do that, we're going to replace the second row with the sum of itself and negative three times the first row. So the first and third rows will stay the same. Now the first entry of the second row will remain zero. The next entry will be negative three times one plus three, which is equal to zero. The entry after that will equal negative three times two plus eight, which is equal to two. Then for the next entry, we get negative six. And after that, we'll have four. And then finally, the last entry will be negative three times two plus four. So this will equal negative two. And so this this is the matrix that we end up with after completing the third step. Now the fourth step in the algorithm says to ignore the row containing the pivot position and all the rows above it if there are any, and then we'll apply steps one through three to the sub matrix that remains. And we'll repeat this process until there are no more non-zero rows to modify. So in our example, we're going to ignore this first row. So we'll just cover it for now so that we remember to ignore it. And then we're going to apply steps one through three to this sub matrix that remains. So starting with step one, we begin with the leftmost non-zero column, which is the third third column. So the third column is another pivot column in the matrix. And then the position at the top of this column, so this position here, will be our next pivot position. Now moving on to the second step, we select a non-zero entry in the pivot column. And so let's just choose to keep this two as our pivot. Now for the third step, we'll use this pivot to eliminate the elements below it. So we'll replace the third row with the sum of itself and negative five halves times the second row. And that will give us a new matrix with a new row three. So this is the matrix that we end up with. And now we'll repeat steps one through three again. So we'll ignore the first two rows now and apply steps one through three to this sub matrix. So we begin with the leftmost non-zero column, which is the fourth column here. So the fourth column is another pivot column for our matrix. And the pivot position will be this position here. And this two will be our pivot for this column. Now we can skip the third step since there are no rows below the pivot. So we'll move to step four. But since this row is the last non-zero row in our matrix, we've completed the fourth step. So after completing the first four steps, we get this matrix. We're notice that this this 
matrix is an echelon form. And you can see this sequence of matrices showing how the first four steps transformed our original matrix into a matrix that's an echelon form. And now from here, there's only one step left in the algorithm. The last step transforms the echelon matrix into a reduced echelon matrix. So step five says to start with the rightmost pivot and then working upwards and to the left, we need to create zeros above each pivot. Also, if a pivot is not one, we need to make it a one by using a scaling operation to multiply the row containing the pivot by some non-zero constant. So proceeding with our example, we're going to start with the rightmost pivot, which is the pivot here in the fourth column, and we'll first use a scaling operation to make this pivot one. So we'll multiply every entry of the third row by one half to get this new row three. Then from here, we'll use this one to get rid of the negative six above it by replacing the second row with the sum of itself and six times the first row. And so if you do that for every entry, you'll get this new second row. Now we're also going to use this pivot to get rid of the one in the first row by replacing the first row with the sum of itself and negative one times the third row. And when we do that, we end up with this new row one. Now, since we're still working on step five, I'm just gonna replace this matrix with the new matrix that we have. So we started with this rightmost pivot. Now we're gonna work up and to the left, working with this pivot next. And since this pivot is not one, we're going to multiply every entry in this row by one half. And then that will give us this new row two. And now we can use this pivot to create a zero in the spot above it. So we'll do that by replacing the first row with the sum of itself and negative two times the second row. And then that will give us this matrix where you can see that this matrix is now in reduced echelon form. So we started with this matrix and then by working through the first four steps of the algorithm, we ended up with this echelon matrix where we know that these two matrices are row equivalent since we used only the three elementary row operations to get this echelon matrix. But now notice that this echelon matrix depended on our choice of pivots. So because we chose the pivots one, two, and two, we got this echelon matrix. But we could have chosen different pivots in our process. For example, if we chose these three pivots, three, five, and four fifteenths, then the first four steps would have given us this echelon matrix. And so you can see that the echelon matrix produced from the first four steps of our algorithm is not unique. But it turns out that the reduced echelon matrix that we get after completing the fifth step of this process is unique. So if you were to take this matrix and apply the fifth step of the algorithm, you would end up with the same reduced echelon matrix that we obtained by applying the fifth step in the algorithm to this echelon matrix. So even though the echelon matrices that are produced after the fourth step are not unique, the reduced echelon matrix that's obtained after the fifth step is unique. And in fact, for any non-zero matrix, there will always be more than one echelon matrix that is row equivalent to it, but there will only be one reduced echelon matrix that is row equivalent to it. So this leads to some new terminology. We say that an echelon form of a matrix A is an echelon matrix that is row equivalent to A, and we say that the reduced echelon form of a matrix A is the reduced echelon matrix that is row equivalent to A. So any non-zero matrix will have multiple echelon forms of that matrix, but there will be exactly one reduced echelon form for that matrix. And now I just want to give one last definition before wrapping up this video. So earlier we defined a pivot position in the first step of our algorithm, but now I want to give the standard definition for a pivot position. So we say that a pivot position in a matrix A is a location in A corresponding to a leading one in the reduced echelon form of A. And notice that since the reduced echelon form of A is unique, there is no ambiguity in this definition. So for our example matrix, the three pivot positions are this one in the first row, second column, this pivot position in the second row and the third column, and then finally this is our last pivot position in the third row and the fourth column. Because those were the locations in this matrix that corresponded to the leading ones in the reduced echelon form of that matrix. And now with that, I think that's a good stopping point, but I do recommend going through this algorithm and choosing different pivots and verifying that no matter which pivots you choose, you will get this reduced echelon form of the matrix because that will give you some really good practice. And so that's all I have for this video. Here I just have a summary of everything that we went over in this video. So first I have the definitions for echelon and reduced echelon form. And then here I have all five steps of the algorithm. The first four steps are called the forward phase of the algorithm, and then the last step is called the backward phase. So you can pause the video here if you like and just read through the summary of what we've done. But that's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching it all the way till the end, and I'll see you next time.